Welcome to the Potter Blog site. It is Monday, the August 29th. This is an update on our radioactive rain detection here in St. Louis. That was 178 times greater than background. I was able to do some analysis on the decay data and it's very interesting in that this uh, rainfall, this radioactive fallout event was uh, different from our previous fallouts and I wanted to go over that in a little bit and uh, give some explanations. Probably a little bit more than I've given in other videos. I always go under the assumption that uh, people have been following what I do on the web page and so I've been making the video short to improve the upload times. But just as a um, as an overview, uh, my primary position since not long after the uh, Fukushima event occurred is that the short half-life fallout that we detect in the rain via Geiger counters is proportional to the longer half-life but hard, harder to detect fallout coming directly out of uh, Fukushima. And in general, when I make these videos, the uh, position I follow or the methodology I use is as a, uh, from a position of research and development. And I balance that against uh, risk analysis and cost effectiveness in making risk decisions. And I do that all from my own personal perspective as, as what I would do under those cases. Uh, the reason I use the R&D approach in this matter is because um, this is an unprecedented event occurring in Fukushima. The world's full of people who understand small aspects and little details of what's happening there. But uh, I don't think there's pretty much anybody who understands on the systems of systems level what's happening in Fukushima. So I throw out R&D data and for the most part I hope that people try to disprove it because I tend to think of this as a uh, sort of as a, uh, a public think tank, public internet think tank. But uh, let's go on to the, uh, to the interesting data that I've come out of the uh, doing the analysis on the uh, fallout data from the, uh, the August 20th uh, highly radioactive rain event here in St. Louis. First we'll go to <coughs> a more standard fallout data and this is uh, decay data from 415 uh, this event was uh, I believe 62 times background uh, this data is uh, beta and gamma emissions only because it's uh, the samples stored in a, a ziploc bag that blocks alpha now the composite half-life that came out of this analysis was uh, 46.2 minutes and I call it a composite half-life because we don't really know what the uh, radioactive materials are made of, made up of. Could be multiple materials, could be a single material, and each material has its own half-life which follows an exponential curve, and you can't add exponential curves together to come up with a, uh, a cum half-life. So basically what I do is, is I plot the data, and then I do a curve fit to the data, and so this is even though it's not completely uh, exponential, this curve fit gives me an effective exponential, an effective exponential, exponential formula that allows me to uh, estimate the half-life. So for St. Louis, this one I measured here is 46.2 minute half-life. Uh, the expected half-life, which people usually claim for the fallout as being a radon prog progeny, is uh, 36.5 minutes. So this half-life is uh, longer than what would be expected from uh, radon daughters. And as I said again, this is from a uh, 62 times background fallout. Now we jump over to the uh, fallout that was on August 20th. Same situation, beta plus gamma is blocked. And this, this reading was 178 times background. Now uh, the one benefit despite all the uh, cancer risks of high radioactive rainfall is that the, uh, the greater the value the better the granularity in the uh, calculations and when I ran this I came up with a 36.4 minute half-life for this radioactive fallout in this rainstorm so that indicates to me that this fallout is almost completely 
uh, radon progeny, two radon daughters, uh, lead and bismuth. So if you find that reassuring, this is a good place for you to stop watching this video because uh, we're going to go into some more information that will make this much less potentially reassuring for you because I know there's lots of people on the internet who say, oh, it's just radon, it's just radon. Well, what makes this interesting is, again, is the how much this has exceeded our previous uh, detections three times, 178 versus 60. I'll show you those real quick. This is a chart that I made up to show uh, some RadNet data censorship, how they were uh, censoring RadNet data. Uh, there's three sets of videos on this that goes into this in the detail. But in here I've put some of the detections we had. 62 times background, 37 times background, 62 back times background, 50 times background measured. If I put a, uh, the recent one on here, it'd be off the scale. Now, of course, as you might well imagine, RadNet was shut down for this event, so we don't have any RadNet data. Big freaking blank. And that's also part of the reasons why I use a uh, research and development approach to this. There's so little data being released to the public that's effectively the only thing we can really do to try to surmise what's happening on a systems to systems level. Okay, so let's go back to the detection here, this 36.4 minute half-life. Now what makes this detection interesting in St. Louis is not just it's, uh, that it was higher and that its short life was much shorter than uh, previous detections. It's that these detections have been pretty much going very high over most of the continental United States along the jet stream and uh, also very high in Canada because the jet stream has been going up through there too. So a lot of times when people talk about radon events uh, they say well it's local radon weather you know it's your it's your local weather that's causing this. Well you know, when you've got a large distribution that, you know, across the entire jet stream stretching across half the continent tends not to be uh, local, especially since I believe a couple of the detections that have been in Canada have been even higher on a uh, count per minute basis than uh, we have here in uh, St. Louis. So we're talking about a radon fallout event that's uh, not based on local action. So you know, what can that mean? Well, let's take a quick look at the decay chart for radon. Here's the isotope data for uh, radon. And this radon breaks down I think after three days a uh, very short half-life and then here we go to what was detected here in St. Louis at PB214 and BI214. Well since this is occurring across half the continent along the jet stream, you know, there's several ex at least a couple of explanations that make some sense for this. Yeah, a local explanation doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, I've posted in the past about photofission occurring in thunderstorms and how that can uh, relate with uh, high atomic weight fallout from Fukushima and cause uh, local events anywhere where there's high atomic weight fallout, radioactive or non-radioactive. Uh, that would tend to vary more locally. Uh, the other potential is that there's a uh, <coughs> since it's a continental wide thing that this is somehow solar or atmospheric related and what that would mean is that this uh, either this astinine or this radon or the PO or PB here is uh, being generated by uh, some sort of nuclear spallation event coming solar related. I'm not aware of any uh, solar information over the last week before this occurred that would lead me to believe that that was the case. So if we follow the jet stream back that takes us back to Fukushima and continental movement of radon is known to occur. So here's where we get into a situation that's a lot like the uh, radioactive sulfur detections that were made in uh, in California and those are detections that would not have been made by the uh, standard nuclear community because radioactive sulfur occurs naturally in the atmosphere and pretty much I surmise that uh, 
most of the uh, nuclear engineers out there, if they would have detected, would have marked it off and said, ah, natural, couldn't have come from Fukushima. Fortunately, um, there were a group of uh, individuals who were tracking non-nuclear engineers, who were uh, tracking sulfur-35 uh, concentrations. And they happened to notice that those concentration levels were uh, much greater than would be expected. And they were able to time that, that magnitude appearing on their detectors in with, the, uh, in with Fukushima. So what we have there is a detection of a natural compound, oh, sorry, a natural radioactive element that's coming from unnatural sources potentially. And here's a quote from uh, some people from UC Berkeley. And what's interesting is that they admit that the radioactive sulfur probably originated from Fukushima, but this is a, from, I think, an LA, LA Times blog. Uh, quotes Edward Morris of UC Berkeley. He said he took issue with the team's final calculations. He basically, they, he's quoted as saying, they're not nuclear engineers. They were a little bit out of their depth. If they were nuclear engineers, this would have never been reported. And the most concerning thing about this statement is, is that they were a little bit out of their depth. Anybody who thinks that they're in their depth in this whole Fukushima crisis, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, it's an unprecedented event. Things are occurring that, from a systems perspective and systems of systems perspective, people don't understand because they've never seen it before so they don't know to look for it. These individuals who detected the radioactive sulfur, uh, they knew what to look for. And that's pretty much the case. Is if you have people who can look at things at the discrete level and you can point them at it, they can look at it and say yay or nay. But tying it together into bigger pictures I think is very difficult for lots of these people. So that brings us back to uh, this isotope data chart. and So when I look at it, if we think of the two things that uh, the radioactive sulfur detection, what made that valid, one was magnitude. The uh, magnitudes of the uh, detections were greater than would be expected. For the last, what is it, it's been almost six months since Fukushima, I've been going through every research paper trying to show that these uh, magnitudes of short half-life radiation we've been experiencing are within expected norms. I haven't been able to do it. Uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, the amounts detected and their detective methods. But uh, I, did able, I was able to track some data down where someone was able to, uh, they had a concern because they detected four times background with uh, using a similar method as I do. But, so one of the things we're looking here for is amplitude. I think we've got a good case that the amplitude is much greater than expected. If somebody out there would like to prove that wrong, it would make me more than, I'd be more than happy to hear it. The other aspect is timing. Has something recently happened in Fukushima? Fact is, for the most part, we're not gonna find out. Historians may be able to tell us when they have access to the data. But again, if I approach this from an R&D R &D perspective and I say, what are things that have occurred at Fukushima recently that could lead to a large uh, creation of a radon, either directly or indirectly? And how does that tie in? Well, if we look at recent events in Fukushima, uh, we have reports of several large earthquakes, cracks opening up in the ground, and uh, steam venting. So there's some indication that this quote-unquote corium has hit the groundwater or is in the ground and it's cracked up and it's steaming. Um, radon is known to be used in Japan to try to help to, uh, detect or predict earthquakes. So I have two methods here that would tie this in and allow us again to follow the, follow the, the perspective that the short, short half-life radiation we're detecting is proportional to the harder to detect harder to detect longer half-life uh, radiation and the way they're proportional is they're both coming over together just one's easier to detect the other one's not with uh, typical instruments 
if the corium is in the groundwater and it's heating up the ground and you've got cracks and steaming coming out of the ground in an environment where there have been a significant number of recent earthquakes, uh, one would expect a uh, large radon release ongoing as long as the uh, ground was being heated and water, especially if it's radon laden groundwater, was, uh, was steaming up through the cracks. Now, the other aspect of this, and you know, here's where I hope for the think tank apps aspect of the uh, internet, is much like the uh, radioactive sulfur 35 was uh, expected to uh, be predicted out of uh, uh, bombardment of chlorine, you know, we could have a potential case where uh, radons being created directly or radons being created uh, through uh, absorption or fission, photofission of uh, astonine-222. Now, I don't have the software that allows me to go through all the predictive measures of what would create astonine-222 uh, or what would uh, create radon-222. Those would be the two best bets of something that's being created in Fukushima that could then come across uh, relatively quickly into the United States and Canada and dump these large amounts of radon. And so these would be the basically, again, the canaries in the coal mine that let us know which where the longer half-life cesium is coming from. And I've heard recently that uh, there are people interested in looking at uh, detections of short half-life fallout and looking at the uh, potential detections of longer half-life, harder to detect longer half-life fallout in it. So that's the summary. And the most interesting things again are this time we actually have detected radon daughters and I'm highly confident of that because of the uh, because of the 36.4 minute half-life versus the 36.5 minute expected half-life. I'm also from a R&D systems assistance perspective uh, relatively confident that it's Fukushima related. Please try to disprove me. Thank you.